Hi everyone, I'm Kevin Ames and uh, welcome to Preserving Digital Assets with Photo Focus and Drobo. Uh, I'm joined today by Nick Minocha, who is the product Director of Products for Drobo. Hi Nick, how are you? Hi Kevin, how are you doing? Great, thanks for having me. You're welcome, you're welcome. So tell us a little bit about what you do at Drobo. So I run all the products at Drobo and uh, control all the uh, products we're releasing for you guys. Just so you know, this is not a webinar about Drobo. This is about preserving your digital assets and strategies for doing that. And we're going to cover a lot of ground in the hour. And we've got uh, a lot going on today. So. Um, Let's begin by uh, talking about some of the important things, and uh, those are prizes. So for those of you that are joining us live, we've got some prizes. We've got uh, two copies of the damn book 3.0 by Peter Crow that tells you everything you need to know about digital asset management, and this is an e-book, and we also have two copies of Luminar 3.1.1 from Skylum. It's standalone image processing software, and it is absolutely great uh, for people that want to explore their images in a different way. So I guess the first question is, where is your data? Well, where does it yes. live, Nick? It lives in a few places. So obviously your computer is your primary source where we've been used to from forever. And then your secondary would probably be an external drive, which we've been loading up and filling for years. Uh, and then probably the third would be the cloud, which is kind of the most popular one right now and kind of trending for everyone. Right. So let's talk about those hard drives. We've got a whole bunch of hard drives up on the screen. And what's the, what? well, first of all, what's the problem with keeping uh, data on our computers? Well, it can uh, easily be lost, stolen, or even uh, the unfortunate disaster could happen and uh, you could lose all your data and that is your life's work. So, you know, data protection is the key there. Right. And one of the things that we've found is that uh, the drives on our uh, computers aren't big enough. Let's, let's see about... Uh, the other place, external storage. We can get much bigger hard drives, particularly since our computers now have SSD drives and getting up much above two terabytes becomes really, really pricey. So we use external drives. The cloud is probably not the best choice and we'll talk about it a little bit later. But today, external drives are pretty much where it's at, right? Yeah, I mean, I think external drives have been one of the biggest key things for anyone who needs external storage outside of the computer. So we've traditionally started with single drives and then kind of kept expanding as we needed more space. So we've got our, our stuff in one of three places, on the computer, on an external drive, and in the cloud. And at some point, the external drives have a problem, and that is they get full. Yeah. So we've got some issues that we've got to handle. And that whole big pile of drives I showed just a minute ago, uh, we've got two different ways of storing our, our stuff, JBOD and RAID. So let's talk about JBOD for just a minute. What does that stand for? It's just a bunch of disks. It's quite literally just, just a bunch of disks. And I think yeah. we've all been there, and uh, I know I have. Those pic that picture of the drives earlier was actually, those are my drives. So I've really been there. And then mm -hmm. RAID, what is a RAID? So that's a redundant array of independent disks or inexpensive disks. So this is kind of the next level. So what's the problem with just having all our stuff on a hard drive? Well, I mean, you have the big problem of you run out of capacity on even those little drives. So you're gonna have to have a carry a lot of them. And right. then you also have the ability of it could be stolen, lost, damaged. There's so many little nuanced things that can happen to them. And there, there's one not so nuanced thing about hard drives, and that is oh. they die. They're just like, what, what's the example? 
Well, it, I always think of hard drives like light bulbs. It's the best analogy you can think of. When you screw them all in, they start failing at about the same time. It's not about how what quality of light bulb you bought. It's just a fact of time. They're going to die in time. Right. So we don't want this. We don't want this to happen to us. And that is um, your data. Rest in peace. So all hard drives die. And so we've got to have strategies to protect against that. Mm -hmm. So that's what this webinar is about, is how we protect our data against failures. And there's several strategies. But let's start with the two versions that we've got right now, JBOD versus RAID. And I think the big thing is we need to talk about the different forms of RAID because there's several different right. flavors. Let's talk first about RAID 0. Yeah, so RAID 0 is uh, typically very fast, and it's just spreading your information across all the drives, as you can see here. Um, it's, it's basically taking every piece of your data and pushing it across every drive possible. And then to receive the data or retrieve the data, it's receiving it from all different sectors. So it's, so it's really, just a really quick fast, way. Right? It's super fast, yeah. It's a really fast way of getting your data distributed. Because what it's doing is while one drive is writing, the other drive's buffers are filling up with data. Right. And then when their buffers are full, they go to the next drive and so on. Well, this sounds like right. an ideal situation for video editors. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely ideal. Uh, this is kind of one thing where you kind of get those, like you said, the buffer speeds to get the video content out faster. So when you're editing, it's lickety split. Okay, well, we've already suggested, actually, it's the truth, it's not a suggestion, that all hard drives fail. So what happens if one of these drives fails? Yeah, that's the uh, tricky part here. So you do get the speed, but you do take the risk of if a single drive were to fail, you've lost your entire data set. So, so this is gone, nope. even though the other drives are good, and there's right. no way to recover it. Yeah, so that, that's kind of the drawbacks of, of a RAID 0 configuration. So the next one is, surprisingly enough, RAID 1. So what is RAID, RAID 1? Yeah. So RAID 1 means it's almost like you start with the two disks, and it will be a copy of your data. So wherever you have your file presiding on disk one, it'll go to disk two. And okay. now this is the only part where you could have one disk fail and still kind of get your data back. So, so the data or is you'd have to the data's mirrored. Yeah, basically it's mirrored so that way if you had to replace a disk, you could easily re-put all the drives on the new drive, all the data back on the new drives. And the only caveat is that you've got to have B drive being the same size as A or larger. Same size, same size. Yeah, exactly. All right, so the next one in line is RAID 5. Yeah. So we have five drives, mm -hmm. and this is a little bit different than um, the other RAIDs. So as we go right. through this, the data is striped across it in segments, A, B, right. C, and then the green one is A P. You say you call that A prime, or uh, prim primary, or it's the pr the principal file. So it's that's the basic file that is your file, and the rest are broken down into little pieces. So if you think we have five drives, we're putting the primary on one of those drives, and then splitting the rest of that file in the remaining four drives. So this way, you could lose a single drive on any drive slot, and you can still rebuild your entire data set. The uh, thing with RAID 5 is that if one of the drives fails, the others, all of the data appears still on the other five, on the other four. So in a RAID 5, you get the same storage you'd get on four drives, but any one of them could fail, right? Right, exactly. Okay. So if you were to fill it with two terabyte drives down the line, and there's five drives, you'd do simple math, two times five is 10, but since you're only getting the full capacity of four drives, you can do a simple math and say you're getting eight terabytes of usable capacity. That's great. Okay, so that's RAID 5. And let's get into what we're doing with external drives. Now, Drobo is a form of RAID, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So Drobo, we kind of take our time to look at what RAID is, and we kind of worked on our own formats, which we'll get into later. But Drobo is a RAID. Okay. And it is protected storage. So 
we talked about RAID 5 being protected storage, so let's delve into that a little bit more. So protected storage means that the disks are protected, but not the files. You could lose a single drive somewhere, and that's fine, but you're not protecting the actual data on the drives. You're protecting the single drive from anywhere being lost. Okay. So the other thing about a Drobo is that it is a combination of a whole bunch of different flavors of RAID all in one. Right. It's kind of a yeah, so up. Yeah, we kind of took the best parts of all forms of RAID and pieced them together and basically took away the complexities of having a user to understand any of the RAID levels and just have this work for them in the best way form. So that's where you guys come up with, you call it Beyond RAID, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we, we, we kind of patented this thing about, you know, as the company started uh, a while back, and it said Beyond RAID would be the simplest way that anyone can set up a RAID and almost look at it as the, the JBOD solution. It's going to work almost identically simple. Well, uh, as, as a matter of full disclosure, I am a Drobo ambassador, and I've been a customer of yours since 2008, which is 11 of the 12 years that Drobo's been in business. And I've been working with Drobo... Uh, like you say, for a long time, and I've been using them, and they give me a lot of peace of mind. Now, I've had other RAID solutions, and we're going to talk about RAID solutions and not specifically Drobos, but I just wanted people to get an idea that there is a difference. So, continuing on, so what is a volume? Yeah, so the best way to describe a volume, it's a great question. People always ask, like, how many, what is a volume? So if we even look at those uh, JBOTs or those independent disks, that's the actual capacity. Of this. If we buy like a WD drive or a C drive, that's a one terabyte drive. Your volume is that one terabytes of actual capacity that's there. It's the space available. It's on a storage device. <laughs> yeah. So if you're using JBOD, each one of those is, it's limited to the size of the drive itself. Exactly. So the advantage to a RAID is that you can get a volume that's bigger than an individual yeah. hard drive. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in like cases of RAIDs, if it's a five bay system, you could add up to five drives and to whatever the capabilities today. I mean, we're seeing 15, 14 and 16 terabyte drives in the market. So you, know, you can do the math on that and see how big of a volume you can actually create. Uh, the space available is on a hard drive or on a RAID uh, like right. a Drobo. So that's pretty cool. That works out really well. So the big question now is moving from JBOD to RAID. So one of my friends is a quite a successful photographer, and this is a look at his desktop. And each one of those orange icons is an individual hard drive. If you look at them, there's, you know, there's all kinds of different names on them. He doesn't have a really good system. And half of the drives themselves are backups of the other drives. So it, it's kind of a mess, and this is really hard for someone to find all of their, their stuff. Another friend of mine has a whole bunch of the little, uh, uh, the little USB-C uh, two-and-a-half right. drives, the externals, and she's constantly plugging them in and out of her uh, USB-C ports. She can't get them right. all on at once, and so backing them up becomes a real problem, and that's part of the stuff that we're uh, working on in helping people learn how to preserve their data. And that's to get everything in one place so it's easily found and you don't misplace it. And one of the things I wanted to ask you, Nick, is what happens if you write a whole bunch of stuff to a hard drive, pull it off of the desktop, let it spin down, you put it on a shelf? Well, just like, you know, you take an analogy of a car, if you put it off of a pile of bricks, after a little while, it might not run. It's, it's not the most secure thing you want to do. I mean... That's why RAIDs are built. It's to keep the disks running and keep your data protected. And that is just kind of natu natural flow. You want to keep those spindles on the drives turning to keep your data intact and, and usable at a different time. Right. Okay. So let's do an example here. We're having issues, but keep commenting, Joe. Thank you very much. So what we have here are, this is a JBOD system, and it's got right. a whole bunch of, d of drives. And the first thing you want to do is you want to total up how much is stored on each one of these. And 
we've added them up and it comes to about 13 terabytes. So anyway, they've got the, you've got 13 terabytes of storage. So that's the first thing we need to know. That's how big a drive that this person would have to have in order to store everything in one place. Well, right now, 14 terabyte drives are available and 16s are coming, but they're not here yeah. yet. Well, they actually are here, but just barely. So somebody that's got 13 terabytes is gonna run out before their bigger drives come right, online. Exactly. So we've got to have a solution of some kind and we need to know how many drives are needed. So in this case, it's 13, that's what we're chasing. And one of the things that I do when I'm working with a, a client is, um, when I'm working with a client is I total up how much they have, just like we've done here. Now we have to figure out how many drives are needed and we use a capacity calculator. Uh, have you got one handy, Nick? I actually do. So let me uh, share my screen here. Great. And this is a very simple way, and we're going to demonstrate this using it as if it were a just a regular standard RAID 5 device. So we're going to use this as an example of just a standard 5-bay RAID here. Now, what we can do is some quick math and go, okay, well, we can assume we're going to start with at least three terabyte drives and just kind of see as we populate this robo crop. On the right side, you can see the pie chart uh, automatically showing us our usable capacity. So if we were to fill this with three terabytes down the line, we can see we're only coming up to about 10.89. So we can actually remove these and try with fours. So it's a great way to kind of see what you're gonna be needing in your capacity, in your calculator. So this is on the Drobo website. And uh, yeah, and then another quick way to go to it is drobo.com, resources, and the capacity calculator. Very simple to get to this. Right. And we tried to make it as easy to understand. Or you can just go to drobo.com, no, it's resources or support, resources. and check for yeah. capacity calculator under the menu. So once you know how many drives, all you do is copy each of those disks back over onto the RAID volume, and everything's in one place. We're not going to get into right. folder structure because that gets really confusing, but this is the basic idea on how to handle this. Next thing is you want to back up to a second RAID 5 device. And we need, we'll talk about what backups are in just a minute and how they differ from protected storage. And the next thing is you want a third copy for offsite. Now we don't expect everybody to go out and implement this all at one. I did mine in stages over the course of, you know, four or five years. And I'll give you what I did later. But right now, Let's get into some questions. This one's big, Nick. Yeah. Is protected storage a backup? No. <laughs> so uh, protected storage is not a backup. So a lot of people come to us and think that, um, but then we explain to them, well, the RAID works in protecting the drives, but not the data. So the short answer is nope. Yeah. Now, what else is not protected? Deleted files, right? Yeah, exactly. So deleted files, if you delete them off your primary working drive, a true backup is something that you could retrieve even if you've deleted it. And that's why it's good to have an on-site backup as your, for your primary working drive. All right. So let's say that that uh, RAID dies. Something goes wrong with it. Power supply is lost. There's um, a thunderstorm or... Oh, let's say that the drive happens to be in your home state where it mud, what is it, mudslides, earthquakes, wildfires, and Wildfire. floods. Yeah. Does that pretty much cover yep. it? Otherwise, very beautiful, but yes. No, it's very beautiful. <laughs> I love California. It's great, but it's, it's probably yeah. a place where you want a backup because if you lose that volume, it's a disaster. You, haven't, you don't have any way of getting it back. So, so that's the difference between protected storage and a backup. So the question, Nick, is what is a backup? So a backup is anything that you have on your primary working drive that's also in a file somewhere else stored locally or offsite. But it's making sure every single file that you have in the working drive, including your recycle bin, 
is so that is true backup. So the reason you want to do that is because the backup gives you a safety net. It's a fair loop. Yeah. So the backup actually copies what's in the on the hard drive, but if you delete on your working drive, but if you delete a file, what's going to happen is it's gone and the backup copies exactly, but the software puts it in a place called a safety net where you both of us use a product called Carbon Copy Cloner and they use the term safety net. So if I delete a file and then later on go, oh my gosh, I need that file, I can go back and find it in the safety net on the backup. It won't be on the working drive. It's like Time Machine for the masses. So if you're a Mac user and you use Time Machine, it works almost identically to that for Windows and Mac in one ubiquitous system. Which is really, really powerful. So the yeah. second copy of the working drive is the actual backup. Or it's actually, yeah, it's the actual backup. And then you probably are going to need a third copy, and that's going to be stored off-site. So this is kind of how I do it. Most people could get by with just a second copy of the working drive. So you've got the working drive, the copy of the working drive, and the second one goes off-site. I keep three copies uh, in my studio, and then my third working drive copy goes off-site. That way I've got, I've got an extra bit of protection. So I've got a backup of the backup just in case that one fails so I don't have to go off-site to get the off-site. And I don't do anything high-tech with the off-site at all. I drop it off at a friend's house, put it up on a shelf, and the next time I visit, I pick it up and go bring it back here, plug it in, and Carbon Copy Cloner says, oh, you're there, and it backs it all back up. So all the missing files on it are backed up, and I'm ready to go. So that's what a backup is. What we want to talk about now is protected storage and backups. So the first one is the working drive. And it's a RAID of some size because we're assuming that we've got more data than we can put on a single hard drive. The second one is the on-site backup. And the third, oh, that's right. The on-site also has the safety net for deleted files. And the third one is an off-site backup, which could also be a RAID or the cloud. Let's talk a little bit about the cloud, Nick. Um, yeah. Advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, obviously the cloud has just been really prevalent in the, in the last few years. It's very easy to kind of get to. Um, everyone kind of has it. If you're on like iOS or Android, you have got kind of got those easy direct channels to the cloud. Um, but the, there's some disadvantages as well that we don't often think about. And it comes in times of when you have to kind of pull that data back. And another a possible disadvantage is as we kind of grow in terms of the technology we're using as well as the files that we're storing or the amount of files that we have to store, it's a variable cost that's going to continually growing um, and you're going to be adding monthly fees that are variable and, and you know, exponentially growing versus an on-prem solution. Right. And you're not, you're not the primary person of the protector of that data, so you're more vulnerable because it's in a bigger cloud area. Well, what that means, I think, Nick, is that uh, you're not in control, and if something goes wrong, uh, people could be really, they could lose their data. And that's happened. Right. Uh, I remember back in the aughts, a company called Digital Railroad gave us 48 hours to get our stuff off of the server. Uh, and if we didn't do that, I know friends that lost very valuable files. I didn't because I had yeah. an on-site backup in my studio. And uh, when the data went away, it just went away. It was no big deal for me. But uh, for others, it was, it was really a problem. And um, yeah. you had a story uh, too. Have, yeah, another one. Another one we kind of had in our customer base is Carbon Copy Cloner. Uh, so Carbon Copy Cloner was a backup solution, and oh, we had a, a personal you backup. Mean, wait a minute, you mean Crash Plan? Uh, sorry, Crash Plan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm I'm thinking of what we're using now, and, and like so much better than what we, you know, what Crash Plan was in the personal account. 
But uh, it basically gave everyone three months to get off of those personal accounts. And, you know, a lot of people were kind of panicking because now we had these added things of egress, which means like the ISP also only allowed you to download a certain amount at a certain time. So it actually even made it impossible for some people to download that many terabytes back down to their own systems. So depending on how much capacity you're using, that also is a factor you have to think about is getting all your data back from the cloud. Right. And that brings us kind of to the um, commercial part of our webinar. And we're not going to dwell on this long, but Drobo's come up with something. It's brand new on the Drobo store, and it's called the Drobo 2-Pack. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Nick? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we kind of created these 2-Pack solutions with like a 5D3 and a 5C because we kind of thought that these were the best of both worlds. So the 5D3... Um, starts with two Thunderbolt 3 ports, so you can daisy chain and, and connect it to a Thunderbolt 3 on a Mac. And then USB-C for either Mac older generations that don't have a Thunderbolt 1 port or 2 port, and uh, a USB-C that could plug into a Windows machine as well. So the 5C also has a single USB-C port on it as well. So with the 5C, you have this really great value for a unit that can be a great backup and a 5 base solution. And in the 5D3, you have a powerhouse of a working drive with up to 64 terabytes of volume in each uh, unit. So they're, they're definitely, you know, like the volumes are humongous, and it has plenty of room to grow. And that's why we think these are kind of the best combinations to kind of do a start of a 3 one backup solution at a great price. Well, and, and at 1048 for the two enclosures, that is a great price, but Drobo's gone a little above and beyond. So if people buy a two pack from the Drobo store, it's no longer a thousand forty eight. As a matter of fact, it comes in nicely under a thousand dollars. So you get these two devices, no drives for nine hundred and forty nine dollars. So this is a great way to get started on backing up all of your data. And so we want to talk about really how you wrap this up and get our heads around it and how to use some of those drives in that JBOD array. So that's where we're going to go next. Uh, this is the website drobostore.com and that pretty much takes care of the commercial on what we're doing with Drobo. So let's talk about we've got our, our 5D3 or whatever RAID we're using as our main one. What do yep. we do with those other hard drives, Nick? Yeah, so let's go ahead and I'm going to share my screen with you guys. I'm going to show you another capacity calculator screen. Um, so right here, what we did is for an example of, we would have already moved our, Drobo, our data to the 5D3. And if you see here, we have a 5 terabyte drive, a 4 terabyte drive, and a 3 terabyte drive. These so are the same drives that came out. Well, let me just back up for a second. We're going back to our uh, moving from JBOD to RAID example. And mm -hmm. where Drobo becomes unique is you can mix the sizes of drives, which you can't do in a standard RAID. So we can take the 5, the 4, and the 3 from the other uh hard drives, we can just take them right out of their cases, put them directly into the Drobo, and carry on. ...to the 5D3, and so now what we're doing here was, without spending added costs, we took the highest size capacities, put them in here, and then we saw that we were still a little under. So what we did is we simply added two more six terabyte drives, and we can see we're right over what we have in the usable capacity of what we were thinking and projecting out at the 13 terabyte line. So this is one of the unique principles and selling factors for Drobos is they allow you to mix and match drives, which is unique to Drobo and what and how Beyond RAID works. Now, the other beautiful thing here is you don't have to future predict what your workflow is going to need. You can quickly add storage even past this as you go. So it basically runs through a layer of data protection when you remove a single drive. Once you see all the lights go solid green, you can add another drive of higher capacity. And you can just keep doing that, everything, through, through you go, till you go through all five drives. So you can upgrade capacity on these all the way up to 64 terabytes as your budget allows or as your capacity needs grow. 
that's great. We're not really getting any questions from our chat pod. So do you have any thoughts on this, Nick, that uh, we haven't really covered? Yeah, I mean, I think the reason why we actually made these two packs is we really understand that we want to protect the user's data. And this is the best way of doing it, right? It was that big question of protected data versus, you know, backups and, you know, making sure everyone has the education pieces they need to know how to use RAID in the ways that, you know, you don't have to be a computer science or a data scientist to know how to do this. We made it super simple for you to run a Drobo and any RAID for that matter, no matter what you're using, it's so important to back up your data in a single usable volume. And that's what, what's so important about RAID and why, you know, if you're any kind of person in a creative professional field, and if you're not using a RAID, why it's so vital to actually get into a RAID now. Right. And it's kind of daunting, but uh, if you have questions, my email is kevin at photofocus.com, P-H-O-T-O-F-O-C-U-S.com. And I'm more than happy to uh, field some of your questions. And we might use those in a future webinar or on posts on PhotoFocus. So, Nick, I've really enjoyed working with you on this. Um, yeah, and uh, MB, yes, we are recording this, and it will be posted shortly after uh, the finish of this live webinar. And if you've got questions, let us know. We'd love to have you uh, on board with us. Do you have any closing thoughts, Nick? Yeah, I mean... Uh the one thing we focus on with the Drobo is making sure that we made it lickety slit and super simple with those lights in front. So even without launching a UI, the Drobo's just kind of got you covered. So I would just say, no matter what you do, even if it's not a Drobo, get your data protected because that's your life's work. You are creative in your workflows and we are creative about how we store your, da your data. So no matter what you do, please go out and get your data protected. Right. And it's really important that people do protect their data because you can't recreate it. Think about it this way. The people that are going through all those horrible tornadoes and floods in the Midwest, the one thing that most of them preserve or wish they'd preserved is their photo album. Well, our photo albums are now on our phones. They're on our hard drives. They're on our computers. And we have to preserve our data. The things that are important are memories. And while film really doesn't ever die because of uh, oh, electricity or storms or things like that, it's subject to flood, fire, and uh, mudslides. But it doesn't have, it isn't as delicate as a disk drive, as a hard drive is. You can drop a film negative and it's still going to be good. If you drop a hard drive, there's a problem. So what we really want to do is have multiple copies in multiple places and preserve our very valuable digital memories. Um, any special pricing nearing or at present for Drobo units? Yes, MB, there are. Uh, DroboStore.com is one place to find them, and you'll see a whole new set of, twin, of two packs. And uh, thank you, Rick. Uh, we're working hard on getting the volume. I don't know why things are changing. Uh, and uh, anyway, there are two packs on drobostore.com. You can also find them uh, at B&H Photo and just search for Drobo and you can get all of the deals there. So thank you all very, very much. We appreciate your participation and we have some email addresses. Uh, please, everybody in the chat pod, send us your email address and uh, we will forward you some prizes. So that pretty much concludes our webinar on preserving digital assets from PhotoFocus and Drobo. Nick and I want to thank you very much for your time and give us some comments so we know how we can do better webinars in the future. The next Drobo and PhotoFocus webinar is on videography and we're going to be working with a young filmmaker who has just gotten his series a place on Amazon Prime. Until the next one, I'm Kevin Ames with Nick Minocha. Take care.